I am so thrilled today to invite a dear friend of mine I've known for many, many years. I've known him to be the same person. I thought of the, I thought of the phrase, long obedience in the same direction. One of the most humble and godly men that I know. Uh, a retired state senator, a seasoned, seasoned liver of life, an outdoorsman, and a, and a man of God, Terry Mullen. I refer to myself as uh, chronologically gifted, but I like that seasoned, whatever that was you said that, Keith. You know, I don't know if you're like me, but a lot of times when I sit down after eating a meal, I get drowsy. And I, you know, just sort of, uh. So I'd like to start out by uh, having everybody stretch a little. Why don't we stand for, stand up. And, and, I, and, and stretch your arms out. I just want to thank you so much for doing that because you just enabled me to win a $50 bet with Keith that I would have you standing and giving me a standing ovation within one minute of when I started talking. And actually, that's not true at all. I would never do that to my friend Keith. You know, they've, a lot of people say that the most uh, fearful thing that anybody has is the fear of speaking before a large group of people. And that just makes me feel a lot more comfortable now, too. But, you know, I, I like the uh, Jerry Seinfeld comment to that. He said, well, does that mean at a funeral you're a lot better off in the casket than given the eulogy. So you may have thought that uh, because I'm a owner of an archery and tackle store that I was going to come today and give you some secrets about musky fishing and maybe some uh, tri tricks on how to shoot some big bucks. Or maybe today I'd, I'd share some uh, ideas about how, uh, because I've been in the, the state legislature for a long time, 12 years, that uh, how the politicians in, in government can solve all our problems or, or cannot solve all our problems. Well, while I'm going to talk a little bit about those things, I really don't think that being a great musky fisherman or a great bow hunter or a good politician is really going to make you a better husband, a better father, and a great leader in the community or, or at work. So actually, when you think about it, too much fishing, too much hunting, and too much politics can really destroy your family relationships. And some of you can probably agree with that and relate to that. I didn't always think that way. For many years, I couldn't get enough musky fishing or hunting. I, it took many years, but I, I finally realized in my 70 plus years, that there's only two things that really matter in life. And that's people and my relationship with God. Those are the only two things that are eternal. But let's face it, fishing and hunting are a big deal in Wisconsin. So briefly, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So let me give you some quick thoughts about musky fishing and bow hunting. Some say the best time to go musky fishing is any time you can get out there and go. But actually what I've found is the best time to go musky fishing is just before you get there and just after you leave. <laughs> when it comes to bait, some people say live bait is the answer, you know, you gotta use live bait. Obviously, those people have never heard of a hog wobbler. <laughs> and they're not going to catch a lot of fish, but you know, that's the deadliest thing known to a muskie. And I'd like to tell you a brief story about the craziest fishing experience I've ever had. I was guiding at the time, and a gentleman in his 60s called me, wanted to go muskie fishing, and he had an 80-year-old father that had never caught a big fish. He said, I'd like to get him out there and get a big fish. So we met at a resort up in Holcomb. We went out on the water. We, just before we got in the boat, he pulls out this little bottle of pills and he said, if I happen to pass out or fall in the boat, slip one of these under my tongue. <laughs> and I thought, great, this is gonna be a really good day on the water. 
Because if the guy does catch a musk, he's probably going to have a heart attack and die on me. And wouldn't you know it, we weren't on the water a half an hour, and he lands a 38 and a half inch musk. And I said, well, we usually just take a photo of him, release him, let him go. He says, oh gosh, the grandkids are all back at the resort. I'd, I'd love to bring it back, you know, and get a picture with the grandkids. I said, okay, so I don't normally carry a stringer, but I had this little stringer. It was a plastic one with these little plastic loops. I hooked it on there, and we were going to keep fishing, so I'd put it in the water, and then I'd pull it out. Well, we got to the last place that we were going to fish, and I went to put that muskie back in the water, and that little plastic loop just straightened out. And that fish was just instantly like six feet from the boat. It was alive. I don't know if we would have lived eventually, but it was alive. And I thought, oh my gosh, I can't lose that fish for this guy. He will have a heart attack on me. And I, would even, and I knew if I tried to reach back and get a net, it'd be too late. So I just dove in the water head first, <laughs> right out of the back of the boat. And just prior to that, I had told, we had pulled up a little point on island. I had just told his son where to cast, where there's a weed bed there, where to cast. And wouldn't you know it, as soon as I hit the water and splash, this, uh, his son hooks a muskie. So miraculously, I don't know how, but I was able to catch that muskie. And I had it like this, and I'm squeezing it, and it's like right here in front of me, and his eyeballs are practically popping out. I started to swim back to the boat, got to the boat, threw the muskie in. But as I was getting by the boat, this guy played his fish around right between me and the boat. Finally, he got the fish out of the way, and I threw the, you know, got the muskie in the boat, climbed back in. The one lens of my glasses were gone. My hat was out there. Obviously, I was soaking wet. The other fellow reeled his, the son reeled his fish in. I netted that. We measured it. It was 34 inches or something like that. We, we put it back in the water. We all looked at each other, and they started laughing. Now, you can imagine what these guys thought. The son hooks a muskie, and immediately they hear a big splash. They turn around and the guide's flopping around in the water. <laughs> so the old man said to me, man, I can't wait to get back to Colorado and tell everybody there the fish in Wisconsin are so big that the guide has to jump in the water and wrestle them back to the boat. <laughs> Some people have said, never measure a fish. It robs memory of creativity. <laughs> And that is why, gentlemen, that is why hunting is a much more noble sport. <laughs> Think about it. A fisherman waits to lie, a hunter lies in wait. <laughs> How many guys here don't bow hunt? There's eh, a fair amount. I want to show you the excitement that you're missing bow hunting. You know, you get out there in the woods, you climb up in your stand or your tree stand, whatever, and you're trying to be quiet and you sit there, you know, and you don't want to move a whole lot. So for the next two hours, this is what you do. Doesn't that look like a lot of fun? <laughs> if your wife told you to go sit in the corner and stare at the wall and do that for two hours, you, you know what you'd tell her. So that brings me to politics. <laughs> Very briefly, <laughs> I discovered politicians are a lot like fish. They'd both be in a lot less trouble if they kept their mouth shut. <laughs> Sometimes that's the same with the wife, right? They also have a very unique way of sleeping. They lie on one side, and then quickly they lie on the other side. <laughs> and finally, when I was in the legislature, I had a guy come up to me and said, Hey, have you heard the latest dumb politician joke? I said, Excuse me, but I am a state senator. He says, that's okay, I'll tell it very slowly. <laughs> 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 
that's why I always prefer to call myself a citizen legislator rather than a politician. You know, when I first got elected to the legislature, I, I said to my wife, you know, did you ever think in your wildest dreams I'd be a state senator? She said, honey, you're not even in my wildest dreams. <laughs> Women have a way of making you humble, don't they? <laughs> Wives. And I was thinking one time we, were, we had a major argument and you know we weren't talking. We're driving down the road out in the country and we drove by this one farm and here was several mules and some pigs in the, in the field there. And I sarcastically said, some of your relatives? She said, yeah, in-laws. So that's enough of musky fishing, hunting, and politics. So let's get back to my main focus. What's really important in life? How did I come to realize that people in my relationship got, with God matter? It's a fishing story, a story of a little boy that developed a fascination for fishing. He dreamed of growing up and being in the fishing business. His dream came true. But in realizing the dream, he discovered something much greater and far more significant than he had ever imagined. It's a true story, true fishing story. It's my story. I was that little boy. If we go back to the beginning, in the beginning, I was born in Whitefish, Montana. When asked why I was born in Whitefish, Montana, my usual reply would be, it's where my mom happened to be at the time. <laughs> But you know, I think it maybe was providential because I would come to love fishing so much and God would use my love of fishing to draw him to him. So why not be born in a town that had the word fish in it? As a young boy, my dad took me fishing and that's where it started. We, were, we went trout fishing on this clear mountain stream. You could see the bottom, you could see the rocks. And I said, Dad, there's no fish. I can't see any fish in here. And all of a sudden, you throw a fly out, and I don't know where the trout is flash up. You can see the silver fish and grab the fly. And I was just mesmerized by it. And, and I just fell in love with fishing. I later grew up on Small Lake Wasota, and whenever we came home from school, I'd be looking at the, at the lake to see what the water conditions were. And as soon as I got home, I'd throw my books in the, on the bed, take off, and, and go down and go fishing. And then <clears throat> when I was about 12, my uncle, was a big musky fisherman, got me excited about musky fishing. And I saw these big fish and man, I was hooked. I started making some of my own lures and I dreamed about you know, being in the, in the fishing business. 1976 was the bicentennial musky year, bicentennial year in our country. And I thought the world needed the bicentennial musky lure. So I made this lure called the Yankee Doodle Dandy. <laughs> It had a blue head with white spots on it for stars, a red back and a white belly. Two propellers, one on both ends. I carded them up five on a card and went around and sold them. I sold a total of maybe 60 of them, so maybe 12 cards of those. I was in a sports shop up by Cornell. Two years after I sold him a card of five, he still had three left on the wall. <laughs> a year after that, he went out of business. And I always felt guilty that maybe it was that poor inventory that I had <laughs> sold them. <laughs> but in 1978, I introduced a lure on the market called the hog wobbler. And it became a classic. It, it, it was an instant success. It had a unique action, some unique underwater sounds that it produces. And then in, in the end of 1986, a friend of mine, another childhood passion I had was archery. A friend of mine owned an archery business in Chippewa called Steve's Archery. He'd been in it about 17 years and I had always mentioned to him if you decide to sell that, I'd be, I'd be interested in buying it because then I could combine it with my tackle business and cover two different seasons and, and I could you know, probably make a living doing that. So he decided to sell and so I quit my full-time job. I was working at the hospital at the time in the accounting uh, business office areas. I quit the job, bought the business from him and I remember being scared to death. I remember I, like somebody had hit me and you, when you're playing football or something, the ball, you fall on the ball and it just knocks the wind out of you. And I, and I was really 
you know, this was a high risk deal. The failure rate in my business is about 999 out of 1,000. So I had quit a, a, a nice job, uh, good benefits and everything else, but it was my passion to, to do this. Well, one year later, after I had been in business, Roger Autodorf, salesman for WWIB Radio, started calling on me. He said, Terry, how would you like to advertise on our station? I said, Roger, Christian radio station? Man, I'm, I'm talking about macho fishermen hunting. You know, I don't know. I, if I come by that station, man, I'll just keep right on going. But he was persistent. He kept coming back to me, coming back to me. And uh, finally one day, I told him, I said, why don't you get a show like Dave Carlson has, you know, on TV 13, where I know there's some sportsmen listening to the, to the program. And he came back to me one day and he said, hey, Terry, how would you like to do your own show? My head kind of swelled up. And I didn't know anything about doing a radio show. And, and I said, well, yeah, I guess so. So I started this little program. At that time, it was on Friday mornings, live. And I came into the, to the station that day. I had, about, I had about four pages of notes. Now, this is like a 10-minute show with, ad, you know, with some ads in between, you know? And the, and the announcers kind of laughed and chuckled. But anyway, the, the show, I actually ended up doing that show for like 22 years. When I got into the legislature, I had to, we had to tape it sometimes ahead of time, but then it got to me with my schedule that I, j I just couldn't do it. So now I'm on this, cra uh, this <coughs> Christian radio show, and, which we started in 1988, and I was dealing with some insurance problems. I went to the insurance agent one day, and as I was leaving his office, he said, I heard you on the radio this morning. He said, are you a Christian? And it was like somebody hit me over the head with a big board or hit me, slapped me right. What do you mean? Do I look like one? Um, you know, and, and I left there, and I, and I said, yeah, yeah, I guess. And uh, I left there, and I got in the car, and that question was bothering me. It was just, why did he ask me that? Why, doggone it, why did he ask me that question? And it kept bothering me. And you know, the, the Holy Spirit just kept working on me. And, at the, t at the time, my business was located downtown Chippewa Falls on the second story of a building for a retail business, probably the worst possible location you could possibly have. Um, and I would always park in the back and walk, walk down the alley and then go up the stairway. And one day, I'm walking through the alley, and there was a, a, a guy that came and was rummaging around in the dumpsters all the time and saving cans and, and collecting uh, cans and then getting paid for them. And it was a hot summer day and there was flies flying all around the dumpster. And I see this guy rummaging in that dumpster and dust and everything's flying out of it. And all of a sudden he took, took, pulled his head out of there and he looked at me. And on his head, he had a cap that said, Moldy's Hog Wobbler. <laughs> and for some reason, I thought of the perverse in Matthew I think it's 2540. It says, whatever you do unto the least of these of my brethren, you do unto me. And I went upstairs, and, and I started saving cans for the guy, and I, and I kept giving him cans. Now, even though I had obtained this dream of mine, being in the hunting and fishing business, I wasn't happy. It wasn't really, I still didn't have a piece about something and I, I seemed to be missing something. In fact, I was even considering selling the business at one time. And now I'm on this Christian radio station, so I'm listening once in a while. And one night in March of 1991, I'm driving home in my truck after closing up my store. <clears throat> I was listening to, the, to WWIB and I heard an interview that would change my life. The announcer was interviewing Al Linder. Al Linder was my idol. I named my business Moldy's Tackle Company because Al Linder started a tackle company called Lindy Little Joe. And I thought, because the kids used to call me Moldy, I, I didn't particularly like that name, but they used to call me Moldy, and uh, I thought if Linder can be Lindy Little Joe, Terry Moulton can be Moldy, Moldy's Tackle Company. 
dumbest thing I ever did. That is the dumb name. How can you put a moldy tackle? The joke used to be, what do you got in your tackle box? Ah, a bunch of moldy tackle. <laughs> but it's stuck and I can't change it after 40 some years. But Al Linder's telling a story about how his wife and, and him had taken their two kids out of the public schools for some reason, some things that were going on, there, and put them in a Christian school. The kids had come to know Christ, his wife had come to know Christ, they were all going to church. And Al said, his wife would come to, and say, why don't you come to church with us? And <clears throat> Al would say, that's no great shakes for me, but it, you know, it's good for you and the kids. And one night, Al was, uh, his, anyway, his little boy said to his mother, does daddy pray like we pray? And, his, and, the, and Al's wife said to the little boy, daddy prays when he's home alone. And Al said one night he's home alone with his little boy. Every, all it, his wife and the other kids are gone. The little boy crawled up into Al's la lap and looked at him and said, Dad, can you pray now? Like you pray when you're alone? Al said, I didn't know how to pray. I didn't know the first thing about praying. When I heard that, it just really sunk in because if my son would have crawled up in my lap and said, Dad, can we pray? That, that was me. That was me. I had too many fish to catch. I had too many deer to chase. You know, I was good to go to church on Christmas or on Easter. But I needed, I needed the Lord and, you know, he was convicting me. My idol was my business. That week was Good Friday. And uh, when I came back from the store from doing my program that Friday, my wife, Sue Kay, said she'd been listening to the radio and a uh, black pe preacher, uh, Evie Hill, and another preacher were saying, what kind of words did they use to rev up the congregation? What was the least amount of words they had used? And Evie Hill said, all I said was, it's Friday, but Sunday's a coming. I'm talking about Christ and his resurrection. I grabbed my wife and I hugged her and I said, honey, it's time that I made a change in my life. And I, I sobbed and cried. And I called the radio station. And that weekend, uh, uh, Easter was on Sunday. The next day, Monday, was April Fool's Day. I called the radio station and said, I want to come in Monday. They had, at that time, they had devotions on Monday. I want to come in and I want to speak. And of course, they know I'm kind of a jokester. <coughs> And they thought I was coming in with an April Fool joke. But basically I told them, I think God wants me to go on a journey with him. And I want to go. And I prayed. And in an instant, in an instant, I thought differently. I can't describe it. It was just, I thought differently from that point on. I was kind of like the angler that I heard about in Russia. And this is a true story. He was fishing, and I don't know what kind of fish they have over there, but apparently they have some really big fish. It sounds like this fish was probably bigger than a, your average muskie. But he hooked this big fish, and he, it's the fish, he couldn't stop it. It just kept going, and he got out to his knees in the water, and he kept hanging on to the rod and trying to stop it and trying to reel. And then pretty soon he was up to his waist. Pretty soon he was up to his shoulders. Pretty soon he was up to his neck and still wouldn't let go of the rod. And finally the fish pulled him under and he drowned. And, and that's kind of the way I was. I had a hold of something that I thought was going to be the ultimate. But really what I needed to do was let go and let God come into my life. In the Bible, in Mark 8.36, it says, What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and to lose his soul? What does it profit you to catch all the biggest fish there are or shoot all the biggest bucks and have all those trophies 
Those aren't eternal. But your soul is. What does it profit you? And I would just say, think about this. You are more spiritual than you are phys physical. This tent, this tent that I live in, is just a physical tent that's going to be gone. But that spirit, that, that, that Terry Moulton, that's he, that spirit is going to live forever. Where it goes is going to be up to you. Because it's going to go either to hell or it's going to go to heaven on choices that you make, on, on a choice that you make. It has been said of a fisherman, first 20 years of his life, his mom asked him, where are you going? I can remember when my mom asked me where I was going many times fishing. The next 40 years, his wife asked, where are you going? And at the funeral, mourners are asking, where, where did he go? Maybe you're, maybe you're here today and you've had a hold of something that's pulling you under. Maybe you feel like something is lacking in your life. Maybe you feel that at this moment God is speaking directly to you. And you realize that you're more spiritual than you're physical. If you're feeling that right now, I've got some really good news. Jesus stands at the door of your heart. And he's knocking. If you open that door, he will come in and your life will never be the same. And you will spend eternity with him in heaven. And I'm going to give you a chance to open that door. If you're here and you, you just feel like God's tugging at you to go on a journey with him, I'm going to pray. And you can pray with me in silence. If you're, if you're feeling the tug of the Holy Spirit. So I just ask that we bow our heads. And I'd like to pray. Just pray this in, in your heart. Lord Jesus, I believe you are God and that you have risen from the dead. God, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I want you to be my Savior and come into my life at this moment. As best I know how, I surrender my life to you. Amen. If you earnestly prayed that in your heart, you're now a new creation. And the angels in heaven are rejoicing. But be aware of this. Somebody wants to pull you away from that. And so, if you prayed that prayer and, and you want to, uh, to continue on, you, you need to pray. You need to read the Bible. You need to re read God's Word. And you need to fellowship with other, Christian, other Christians. I didn't do that right away. And it took me a while to start growing. Fortunately, I met somebody like Keith. Got involved in a study called Growing in Christ, 13-week study. We got plugged into a church. And my wife and I started going to church together. And one of the things that really strengthened our marriage was we started praying together at night when we go, before we go to sleep. Sometimes I don't feel like it. So reach out and grab my hands and we should pray tonight. Sometimes she doesn't feel like it. I said, honey, we need to pray tonight. But it's really strengthened our marriage. So I'd just like to leave you with what I call an old, old fisherman's advice. If you want to be happy for an hour or two, take a nap. If you want to be happy for a day or two, Go fishing. If you want to be happy for a lifetime, serve others. If you want to be happy for eternity, know Jesus. And I like to put them in reverse order. Know Jesus, serve others, go fishing, and every once in a while, take a nap. <laughs> if you're here today and, and it's a like I say, the first time you had prayed that prayer, I would like to talk to you. Somebody up here would like to talk to you. But uh, I just want to say God bless you all. And uh, thank you.